all of those lives that have been changed and touched by Jesus Christ. That's why we exist as a church, to reach people and to make him known. And uh, I want to welcome you here today. Thank you for being with us this morning. I want to welcome our online audience. We appreciate everybody that tunes in every week. Can we give our online folks a big hand to welcome them in as well? Um, Happy Palm Sunday to all of you today. Uh, Palm Sunday is a very uh, special day for us as believers. And uh, if you're maybe new to all this and you don't really understand what Palm Sunday is, Palm Sunday is really the Sunday that marks the beginning of Jesus' Passion Week. Uh, On that Palm Sunday in the Bible, he actually rode into the city of Jerusalem where some pretty paramount things happened that week. And then ultimately, he died on the cross on Good Friday for your sins and mine. And uh, we like to to take time to to be reverent to that fact and to know that God loves you so much. Think about that. There's one message I feel in my heart today to share with all of you and those of you who are watching today, is that Palm Sunday is a reminder of how much God loves you. Um, I don't know if you've heard that lately, but God loves you more than you will ever, ever know. In fact, somebody wisely said that if you or I were the only ones on the face of the earth, Jesus Christ would have died for you. And so I uh, hope that you'll receive that good news. And the, the best news of all is that on the following Sunday, Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead, he defeated death, hell, and the grave, and now we have hope that we're not only gonna live with him in this life, but we're gonna live for eternity. Isn't that good news today? Nothing but good news. And uh, also real quick, before we dive into the message, I wanted to piggyback off uh, the video and what Pastor Andrew shared a few moments ago about Right Now Media. Um, That is our gift to you. And um, one of the things as a church Uh, we understand is the power of media. We try to do a lot as our church. We try to be up to date on things. We, We try to be relevant. We try to reach people any way that we possibly can. And media is, you know, influences us unlike anything else, especially younger folks. And so right now, media is our gift to you. It's just like having a Netflix or Hulu or whatever you have. It's our gift to you. And it's all kinds of great Christian content. Also, that's gonna be a blessing for all of our community group leaders because on that, there's all kinds of curriculum you can use if you wanna be a community group leader. A lot of really good stuff, stuff for your kids and right on up to um, what Andrew said about old people. I was, after the first service, I joked by, I'm like, "Um, I just had a birthday, are you calling me old? And we laugh, we had a joke. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's word today. We are in our series called Salt Life. And um, very simply, some of you might know that term, salt life. If you've been to the beach, you've been to Florida, uh, salt life's kind of a term that people put bumper stickers and have t-shirts and all kinds. In fact, Christy has a salt life shirt. And uh, if you love the beach, it's the salt life, right? Well, we're taking that to the next level and probably a truer, more meaningful meaning. And that is, Jesus said, you and I are the salt of the earth. And this short little series we're doing, my hope, is to encourage you that all of us would live salty lives, that we would make an influence in the world for Jesus Christ, that somebody's life would be impacted because of the life that you live. So we've been having a lot of fun. We've been talking about salt. We've been talking about food. And uh, I shared with you last week about sweet and salty and those snapper things. Those are absolutely delicious. We were in Columbus this week with some ministry training and Dan James and Kirsten bought Christy and I our very own bag. We sat in a hotel at 11 o'clock at night and pounded those things. They're, just in case you're wondering, it's a pretzel with caramel and chocolate and sea salt. And they gave us like a five pound bag. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Okay, all right. Today, I've been making you hungry every week and today I'll do my best to make you hungry once again. But I wanna talk to you real quick about the invitation. I I titled today's message, um, The Invitation. How many of you know we all enjoy invitations, right? When we're invited somewhere, somebody that you love or respect invites you to something, you get to go somewhere. In fact, Christy and I, were in, when we came up with this idea, we were in Florida, we were invited, uh, our denomination invited uh, Christy and I and 200 other pastors to hang out and, and they, they were excited about what God was doing in the church here and it was cool, it felt good to be invited to that. We all like to be invited to things and that's where this whole idea of salt life um, kind of came from for us. How many of you know the greatest invitation the world has ever known? 
is in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his own son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I don't know if you realize it or not, but we're agents of that invitation. God's expecting you and I to share that invitation with the world. We're gonna go ahead and look at a portion of scripture in the book of Luke. This is Jesus. He's at a religious leader's house. And it's really what it is, is kind of a setup. They're trying to trap him. And then he talks about heaven and likens it to a supper, to a, a feast. So here's what the Bible says. Now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then his, the master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded and still there is room. I, I love this last part. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. And then it closes kind of strongly for I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Father, we just pray that you bless this time of sharing in your word today. Help us to be salt and light in our world. In Jesus' name and amen. You can be seated today. Um, I don't know what you think about when you think about people who have impacted the world for Christ. Um, when you think of names of, of maybe great men or women of God that have made an impact on the world for Christ, there's a few names that stick out to me right away. Probably first and foremost, I think we would probably all agree that um, Billy Graham was one of the greatest men to ever serve God. In fact, somebody said that, that Billy Graham is responsible for winning more people to Jesus Christ than anyone in history next to the, the Apostle Paul. It's pretty wild if you stop and think about that. But there's another man that's very well known, maybe not as well known to you and I, uh, but definitely well, definitely well known to me. Uh, he's a man by the name of Reinhard Bonnke. Has anybody ever heard of Reinhard Bonnke before? Reinhard Bonnke was an incredible man of God. He was actually born in Germany, and at nine years of age, he put his faith in Jesus Christ, and at 10 years of age, he felt a call to go into ministry. And as he was praying about what God would have him to do as a young man, one night, he, he mentioned in his biography that God gave him a dream. And as he was sleeping, he dreamed of the continent of Africa. And he saw the continent, of, the, the continent of Africa turn red. And when he saw it turn red, he heard this voice, like the voice of God saying, that Africa shall be saved. And then he had another dream, and it was very similar to this one. And he knew as a young man that God was calling him to Africa to preach the gospel. And he did that. He went there for many years, and he would put these small gatherings together and small crusades and then as time went on, these crusades got bigger and bigger and bigger, so much so that he built a tent. He had a tent created. It was the largest tent made at that time, and it was made to seat 34,000 people at one of his crusades. And literally the day before the crusade, a windstorm came through and knocked his tent down and ruined it. So they decided to go on and have the crusade anyways in more of an outdoor form. And it was a good thing that God allowed the wind to blow down his tent because 100,000 people showed up that day. And as he began to share the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ with people, his Crusades begin to grow and grow. In fact, in this picture, there is a crowd of people as far as your eye can see. As a matter of fact, um, in many of his latter crusades in his life, he had more than a million people in one crusade. And he would share Jesus Christ and God would do some incredible things. Well, he was very known around Christian circles, kind of an icon in the faith. 
And when I was in my early, early 20s, I don't even know if I was 25 yet. I might have been 24, 25. I was really on fire for God. I'd received my call into ministry. I wasn't in full-time ministry yet, but I was in my training and transition time. And my pastor, Pastor Tony Scott, that I worked for for many years, he just had a knack for getting important people to the church. I don't know how he did it, but we had lots of great men and women of God who would come through the church. And Reinhard Bonnke back then was doing a tour through the United States and sharing about some upcoming stuff. And lo and behold, he came to our church in Toledo, Ohio. And he did a, uh, he, he preached on, on Saturday night. He preached two services on Sunday. And for whatever reason, my pastor asked me, he said, Matt, um, on Sunday afternoon, uh, Reinhard Bonnke and his wife need to be picked up at their hotel, and you need to drive them up to Detroit. I'm like, are you serious? Are you serious? I, I, I should do that? And, and he's like, yeah, I don't know why he picked me. Why, I knew that he thought it would be special, and I appreciate him doing that for me. So uh, they left me a different car, because he probably didn't want to ride a Mahoopty that I was driving that day. So uh, I nervously go to the hotel, and I pick up him and his wife, very sweet, put their luggage in the back, and they're in the back seat, and I'm driving. Now, from Toledo in the area where he, this, uh, where he was going to be preaching at a church, it was more in southern Detroit, and the quickest route took me into more of some rural back roads in Michigan. I didn't take the highway. I went through some rural back roads. <laughs> no joke. And unfortunately, in my route, there was a lot of train tracks. And nowadays, most every train track, you know, it has the arms that come down and the bells and all that stuff to make you have to stop. Well, I kept hitting a few railroad tracks that didn't have those. And on one particular railroad track, you know, I was very caught. You have Reinhard Bonnke in your car. I mean, I was very cautious, and I'm slowing down at this track, and I look down the way, and I see a train, and it's coming, and it's, it was a little ways off, and, and if I was by myself, frankly, I would have just gone, you know, but I'm like, I have Reinhard Bonnke. Maybe I should wait. Should I go? Should I wait? Should I go? Should I wait? In his, his very strong German accent, he goes, just go, just go. No, okay, but I go, and we zip across there, and... Thank you, Jesus. I got him to the church safely. And I went back and I was joking with my pastor. I said, Pastor, could you imagine if something would have happened and I was responsible for something happening to Reinhard Bonnke? And my pastor just laughed. He said, Matt, I can guarantee you that would have been the beginning and the end of your ministry. <laughs> That's kind of cute <laughs> and very true. But I say all that to say, you know, we all enjoy invitations. We, we love to be uh, invited into the presence of people we respect. Maybe that's a boss or, or somebody that you know and love or a music artist, whoever it is. Well, that's the whole idea with this invitation today because we're going to learn that, that God has given you and I the greatest invitation the world would ever know. And Jesus uses this particular story that he's in right now to kind of share with you and I this incredible invitation that God has given to you and I. And it all starts in the beginning of chapter 14, which I did not read to you. Uh, Jesus was invited to some of the ruler's house, this one particular Pharisee. Uh, basically what they, these Jewish people would do, the leaders, is they would all rub elbows together and hobnob with each other. So typically what they would do in those times is after they spent the day at the synagogue, they would invite other leaders over and they would gather and, and usually have a large meal together. And so Jesus was invited to the ruler of, one of the rulers of the Pharisees' homes. And, and of course, this was, you know, you would think this was a great honor, but actually, this was not an honor. This was a trap. And the reason why they invited Jesus over is they did not believe he truly was the Messiah. Now, they knew from all the prophets and all of their history that God said a Messiah would be coming. But when Jesus came, they did not want to really affirm that he was the Messiah. So they're always trying, trying to discredit him. So what they did was, is they have him over for dinner. Now, how many of you know you can't trick God, right? So he's there, and the Bible goes on to say, I think there, here's the, the first verse. He's at the house. Here's the second one. There it is. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. So imagine this. All these religious, high-minded, influential men that 
You know, I'll rub your back, you rub by, you scratch your back, you scratch mine. They're all, they're hobnobbing together. They invite Jesus and just so happens that there's a man there that has dropsy. Now, dropsy in the Bible meant that your body was retaining water. So it could, you know, from a heart condition or whatever, people's bodies can retain water. Well, this man was very swelled up. And I'll tell you right now, that man would not have been invited there had not Jesus come. They didn't let cripple people, and they looked down on people like that. And so this man would not have been invited. And what they were trying to do is they were trying to trap Jesus, because this is what they thought. They thought, if Jesus does not heal this man, then we can go out and say he lacks compassion. If he does happen to heal this man, then we believe that any work on the Sabbath, including healing somebody, is breaking God's law, which was not true, by the way. That was all man-made stuff. Uh, They love to make all these rules, and they were trying to trap Jesus. And of course, Jesus knew that, and He stands in front of the man and he looks at the men and he says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And the men were quiet. They they didn't want to say one way or the other. And then he asked them the question. He says, any of you men, if you had an ox that you owned that had fallen into a ditch and couldn't get out, would you not on the Sabbath get your ox out of the ditch? And of course, right there he had them because of course they would. And then Jesus says, well, why wouldn't I heal this man? And immediately he heals that man and he sends him away. And these men are absolutely speechless. Because what Jesus did is once again, he unveiled their hypocrisy. They said one thing and they lived something else. And then he goes on to share a couple really important parables. Like he goes on to say, when you are, it's all about feasts. He said, when you're invited to a wedding feast, He said, don't go sit at the highest table, the most important table, and exalt yourself like that. He says, what if the the master of the, the feast brings somebody more important than you, and then they come to your table and they tell you, you gotta get up so this guy can sit here. It'd be very humiliating for you. So he went on to say, it's it's better to humble yourself that you will be exalted later instead of exalting yourself and being humbled. And he was what he was doing was calling out their hobnobbing together, always trying to hang out to get ahead. And then he goes on to say, when you host a feast, don't just host people that can help you and get you ahead in life and business. And if you do that for business, there's not a problem with that. I'm just, this is more of the spiritual context of it all. But what he's saying is when you have a feast, he's telling these people, don't just invite people that can help you, but invite those that are sick, those that are poor, those that are lame, people that can't repay you and you will be repaid in the resurrection, meaning in heaven. God will repay you later on. And then one man who wants to sound spiritual pipes up in this moment, verse 15, look what he says. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of of God. So this man wants to be super spiritual, and he said, blessed is the one who gets to eat in heaven. Because these Jewish people believed that heaven, part of heaven was like a big feast. And they were confident because they did everything right, that they deserved heaven, that they earned heaven, and they couldn't wait to go be in heaven and eat with God and all the saints of God is what they believed. And what Jesus does is he goes on to tell this this story to really highlight their false confidence. And he goes on to tell this story and he tells us what the feast, invitation from God or going to heaven is really all about. I'm gonna give you three things in the next couple minutes. They'll help you and I to understand God's incredible invitation to you and I and our responsibility to share that with other people. Let me give you three things. Here's number one. And that's this, that God's invitation to eternal life is for all people through Jesus Christ only. Notice what he says here in verse 16. He's speaking of God. He's using this as a a parable to speak of God. Then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper and he invited many. So this is a a story really pointing out heaven. And the great man with the great feast would, of course, be God. And he begins telling us a little bit about heaven. Heaven. I don't know about you, but I don't think we talk about heaven enough. In fact, I was just at a funeral recently, and somebody came up to me and like, you know, I don't know, do you you notice that you don't hear about heaven a lot? You don't hear people preach about it a lot? And I'm like, you know, I I don't hear a lot of sermons about it. And, you know, we've done some of those sermons here, but 
It's like, yeah, I mean, I don't think we hear enough about heaven. Heaven is awesome. I don't know you, I mean, sometimes we, we focus all of our attention in this life, but the older you get, you realize that, you know, heaven is, is coming. I mean, and, and tomorrow's not promised to any of us. And, and so we realize, but look what the Bible says about, about heaven that I think is, is awesome. The Bible says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can even conceive what God's prepared for us. Think about that. Look at what the Bible says in Revelation about heaven. It's better than anything we can imagine. It says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain. The former things have passed away. So in heaven, this is what the Bible tells us. There'll be no more sickness. That sickness that you've battled or somebody that you know and love has battled. If you've lost somebody in your life, uh, somebody died that you love, that may be a father, a mother, a grandparent, a close friend that was a believer, let me tell you what, battled sickness, disease, I'm gonna tell you what, they're in no more pain anymore. There's no more crying, no more mourning. I mean, think about what heaven is gonna be like. Being in a place where there's no more death, after we physically die this one time, unless we're here for the rapture, we're, you know, one time we're going to heaven. Think about that, never to die again. It's pretty awesome. In fact, the Bible says that uh, in, in Psalm 84, it says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Think about that. Better is one day in heaven than a thousand elsewhere. I heard somebody say it like this. Take your best day on earth. What is, what is your best day or one of your best days on earth? Think about it, whatever it was. You know, I think about some of my best days. You know, when I gave my life to Christ and surrendered my life to Christ, that was definitely one of my best days. When I married my lovely wife, Christy, was another one of my best days. And probably the other days were probably when my kids were born. You know, when my son Brady was born, you know, Christy and I, we'd had some fertility issues for many years and weren't sure we were going to have kids at all. And then we had to have a bunch of fertility intervention. And some of you have heard our story before, but it was a very trying time for us. And it looked like it wasn't going to work. And I mean, we had emotionally just been through the mill and back again. Anybody that's ever struggled with fertility, we feel, we feel for you. It's, just, it's the real journey. It's hard. And we emptied our bank account and did all we could. And, and then suddenly, they said about a one in 10 chance that Christy would end up getting pregnant. She got pregnant. And it was, an up, it was a mostly good pregnancy, but it was a little up and down at times. And then Finally, the time came for Brady to be born. He was a big baby. Nine pounds, three ounces. He's a big boy. I don't think he's going to end up big because I'm his dad. But uh, anyways, you know, Christy, the way she was carrying the baby, the doctor said, you know, you need to have a C-section. And so I'll never forget the day, you know, they hooked that little heart monitor up to the baby in the, in the pre-op room, and you can hear his little heartbeat. dum 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 Everything's perfect. They take us into the room, and... And uh, Dr. Stewart, uh, he was our doctor from Akron General, and he's a Michigan Wolverine grad, so <laughs> he had his Michigan cap on. I was like, I am in right in the right spot, you know, sorry. And uh, anyways, so the C-section goes flawlessly. He pulls Brady out, and he, he puts him over, and he gives him to the nurse, and Sets him down on the table. He's screaming. He's well, she didn't go on like this. And, and Christy can't see him yet because she's, you know, laying down. They're still having to finish up the surgery. And I'm just screaming, Christy, he's beautiful. And, and I'm screaming and I'm crying. I got the nurses crying. And I want to tell you, it was, it was one of my best days. And then Ashlyn was born, our daughter. She was in the video too. My son couldn't keep his thing. Yeah, that's Brady for you. Um, born with energy. But Ashlyn, you know, she came. We thought we'd never have any more kids, and she came naturally, just a total gift of God. And, and those days will forever be burned in my mind. But, you know, this gentleman said, take your best day, multiply it times a 1,000, and that won't even equal one day in God's presence. Heaven's going to be awesome. How many of y'all believe there's going to be food in heaven? <laughs> you better believe there's food in heaven. As a matter of fact, I had some more heavenly food. I, I didn't want to leave you hanging. So we were in Columbus for a few days getting some ministry training this week, and uh, we went to uh, Friday night, the guys and I, and Christy was with us, we, we went to Mongolian Barbecue, you ever had that place before? You pack all your meats and all that stuff in a bowl, and then they, doesn't look like much, it's almost kind of gross at first, and then they cook it, and it's like, oh my gosh, this is glorious. Uh, but then from there, we went out, and we were at Easton Mall, and we went to, Je anybody ever have Jenny's ice cream before? Holy mackerel, that stuff is heavenly. I had this, um, what I had was this, salt. Being speaking of salt, I had salted peanut butter ice cream with chocolate flecks. 
Why well, come? It's a flake. It's a chunk. But they were like, they're flex. It was a flex. And so, uh, and then I got a scoop of this like berry lavender. I literally had lavender. It was purple. Oh my goodness. In a, in a waffle bowl that I scarfed. It was wonderful. But I say all that to say that in heaven, the reason why Jesus is using the analogy of a feast is because the Bible teaches us that for those of us that believe in Jesus, there is going to be this thing in heaven. I'm not going to read the whole scripture for the sake of time, but if you put it up here, um, well, maybe I should. Uh, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. The wife is the, the global church of Jesus Christ, is the bride of Christ. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So in heaven, in the timeline, there's going to be a moment where you and I are going to eat this marriage supper. It's going to be this great celebration in heaven, and we're going to eat this supper, and it's going to go on for quite some time, and we're going to eat with all the great people of the Bible. It's going to be absolutely awesome. So I, I say, and that's right before the second coming of Christ, Battle of Armageddon. God comes down here and takes care of business, wipes out all his enemies. And I did a series called Tomorrowland. If that freaks anybody out, it's God's got it covered. Don't worry. He loves you. All right. So I said all that though to say that there will be food in heaven and God doesn't want us to miss this. And here's what I want to say. Sadly, people miss heaven for all the wrong reasons. That's what's, that's what's sad. No, so, so, so the Bible says that the way this worked was, how they would do a, a, a feast back in these days is you would get an invitation to come to a feast. And just like we do today for weddings or whatever, you would RSVP back. And then they would know how, much, how many to cook for based on the people that RSVP'd. And then there would be two calls to a feast like this. Then once the feast is ready, the, whoever's putting the feast on would send their servants out to let everybody know they didn't have, you know, cell phones and text messaging, so they'd have to send people out to tell the people, okay, the, the feast is ready, come on and let's eat. So in this particular story, this man has a great feast, everybody's RSVP'd, he sends the servants out to go get them, and he sent his servant at, at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are ready, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. They made excuses. Now, for the Jewish people of this day who he was talking to, they had all RSVP'd about the Messiah because they knew from Old Testament prophecy that God was going to send a Messiah to liberate them. They knew that. But when Jesus, that was like the RSVP. When Jesus showed up, the Messiah showed up, by and large, the bulk of the religious people, leaders, did not want to admit that was him. So they were invited to the dinner and they RSVP'd, but when he showed up, they didn't come. And they made all kinds of excuses. One guy, because of material possessions, he said, oh, I, I just bought some land, I haven't seen it yet, and I gotta go see it. The other person said, you know, I bought five yoke of oxen, like 10 oxen, I gotta go try them out. Other person said, hey, I just got married and, and I gotta spend time with my wife, I'm sorry, I can't come. All these are flimsy excuses, Bible scholars tell us that, because... You know, no one would buy land they didn't see. No one would buy oxen they haven't tested. And if you got married, it was a big deal back then and you would have known way ahead of time and you would have never RSVP'd in the first place. They were all lame excuses for not going. And Jesus knew that. He's calling these. So in this story, he's, he's making their hypocrisy known. He's, he's calling them out. But I think for sometimes for us, we can get so caught up in material possessions that we miss Jesus. You know, there's people that are living. I, when I think about heaven and I think about this life and I put all my eggs in this basket, let me tell you what. Jesus said, you know, what, what, does it, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Man, it's great to be blessed in this life and I believe God wants to bless us, but that's not what it's all about. Like, this life, it's here and it's gone. Just like that. I mean, how many times have we seen, you know, things happen like, what just happened with Dwayne Haskins, if you saw that? I, it was heartbreaking. You know, the, this young man, 25, all the talent in the world. A terrible accident happened. We want to pray for him and his family. I can only imagine his young wife and what they're going through. But having a life, it's like, it's here and it's gone. Just like that. Why am I living with all my eggs in this basket, right? Um, 
because heaven is, is where we're going to end up. And, you know, chasing our careers or whatever it, it be, don't let anything get in the way of you and Jesus Christ. That's all I got to say. And here's, here's the second thing. And that is that God's invitation is now extended through us. So look what happens. The servant says, all right, um, the, they're all making excuses. They're not coming. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring here the poor, the maimed, and the lame, and the blind. Now, if you were in one of those prestigious gatherings, these were still Jewish people because the gospel came to the Jewish people first. And they rejected it. And because of their rejection, the book of Romans says, now it went out on all the Gentiles. Most of us here are Gentiles. We're not Jewish. So we've all been a part, we've been grafted in because they rejected Christ. Now we've received Christ. And they'll, eventually there'll be a great revival in Jewish people, but we'll get to that some other time. But the idea is, is this, that he said, go and get the outcasts. So these were Jewish people, but they were tax collectors, prostitutes, sick, lame, blind. He said, bring those people to my feast. Those are the people that I want to bring to my feast. See, God cares about every single person. So he goes out and he does that. And um, they fill the place up, but there's still room. Look at verse 23. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. So after they brought in all the Jewish people they could, he said, now go to the highways and the hedges. That means go to the Gentiles, go to the people that the Jewish people thought were completely unworthy, and you go and bring them in. That would include all of us. Let me tell you what, God loves everybody. Jesus died for every single human being. God loves you. God loves the world. And notice what he said, you go, and the way you and I can see ourselves in this story, don't miss this, we're like the servants. Jesus did all the work, and he's sending you and I out. Remember I said a couple of weeks ago, like, like a salt shaker, how you sprinkle salt on your food? God sprinkles us wherever he wants us to be. Do you realize today, it's no accident, if you're a Christ follower, you're really trying to follow Christ, it's no accident you live in Canton, Ohio, or the greater Canton area. It's no accident you have the family you have, you live in the neighborhood you have, you have the job that you have, I mean, you have the connections that you have, your kids go to the schools that they do. Like everything by God, there's no accidents. Because God put us in those very places and relationships so that we could be those that extend the invitation to God's eternal life through Jesus Christ. God wants us to share with the world how much he loves them. So we gotta go out wherever we are and be salty. Like we said last week, sweet and salty. We're sweet, we live it, and we're salty, and we're not afraid, we're not ashamed. Look what the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? If somebody were to find out at work you're a believer, would you be ashamed of that? Or would you be somebody that just says, you know, I'm a believer and I thank God for what he did for me. Those moments you know, I think sometimes, you know, if you have somebody at work that's struggling, it's a great opportunity to just share your faith with them. We joked last week, we don't beat people overhead with the Bible. We just, when the right moment opens, we, we share. If you have an opportunity to pray or share your faith with somebody. If you have somebody in your life you're talking with and they're ready to receive Christ, it's simple as, it's a simple prayer. In fact, I hope Kimberly doesn't mind, Kimberly Liliosis doesn't mind, but um, her, her mom passed away a, a few months ago. And she came to me and, and thanked me. Uh, she said, Pastor Matt, um, my mom passed away, and she said, I, I just want to thank you because I, I, I had an assurance that she had given her life to Jesus Christ before she passed. She said, I, I knew my mom was ready, but she said, I wasn't sure exactly how to like, lead her. And she said, I remembered that every single week when we come together as a church, you always give an invitation to pray that prayer. And because you do that every week, I knew what to pray with her. And I led my mom in that prayer, and I know that I know that she's in heaven today. Isn't that awesome? Way to go, Kimberly, by the way. Um, but it's not some special magical prayer. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess through the mouth Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. So leading anybody to prayer is just having them confess that they need Jesus, that they believe in Jesus. God, forgive me. It's simple. Um, and that's what we can do. But you know, it's interesting, statistics say that 95% of um, all believers never lead another person to Christ. Isn't that something? Most people don't ever do that. 
But you know, if you have somebody, like sometimes people are like, I know, they're, I know they're hungry for God. I know they're searching, they're seeking. I don't feel ready to, to pray with them. Or, Well, then just invite them to church. Um, we do this every week. That's, what we, that's our goal every week is that people would come to Christ. And so you can invite them here and they'd have a good, wonderful experience. That's our hope. But I want to close with this. Here's the third point today. Um, our job individually, as, as individuals and as a church, is to fill heaven. That's why we're here. At the end of the day, we're here to know God, to love God, and to make heaven full. In fact, look what the Bible says. Here's it closes. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and, by, and hedges and compel them to come and look at this, that my house may be full. That word compel, it actually, uh, it, it means to have a powerful, irresistible effect or influence on somebody. Like, compel them. Like, God wants his house to be, you know, when I came here nine years ago as the pastor of Woodlawn, um, I talked with the leadership, and I said, this is what God's called me to do. It's what God's called Christy and I to do. We're here to build God's kingdom and build God's church by reaching people, making disciples. That's why we come. That's why we're here. And if you want that, that's why we're here. And they said, we want that. And not everybody wanted that. We found out later, but most people did. But we never make an apology. We're a great commission church. We never make an apology that we care about people that don't know him. We just don't. Because I don't know about you, somebody, got, somebody, somebody intervened in my life and I'm here today. And God wants us to intervene in the lives of others. That's why next week, we got all kinds of people coming here. It's big, probably the biggest we've ever had, at least from social media at this point, especially Saturday. But you know, just pray. We actually, we have a prayer force gathering. If you're on the prayer force Tuesday night, I forgot to say that. That's important. We need to really pray that the weather is good and that everything goes good next weekend. But I'm going to close with a story and then we'll take communion. We'll wrap it up. Years ago, I, I, I kept having these thoughts of when I was a younger man, young guy, when I first got called into ministry, that whole Reinhardt Bonnke thing got me thinking about when I was young and younger, still young. I'm just, just a little younger then. Um, <laughs> But I had this story, check it out. This, I, I, this, I had to share this with you because it's just something I, I'll never forget. When I was a young man, around that same time, I was doing some work at my house when I lived in Toledo and I borrowed my brother-in-law's skill saw, his little, his little skill saw. I didn't have one at the time. And I borrowed his. His was old and junky and beat up and I know it was on its last leg. I made two cuts and the thing burned up. I'm like, oh, smoke, you know. And I'm like, well, I have to be a good brother-in-law and I went to go replace it for him. So I went to buy a new one. And when I was driving to the uh, hardware store, I, I bought, my, bought my stuff, bought a new saw, and I was driving back home. And as I was driving, I saw this gigantic dude walking down the street. He was dressed all in black. He had long, dark hair and, and this long, like, ZZ top beard, you know, like the long beard. He looked mean. He looked tough. And I was driving home, and I felt the Holy Spirit in my heart. It was not an audible voice. It was, I felt it in here. Felt the Holy Spirit say, go back and talk to that guy. <laughs> what? <laughs> Ain't no way. But the further I drove, the more I felt it. You know, if you're ever running away from God, you know it. Because the, the more you go, the more you feel it. So I, I turn around and I drive back and he's not there. And I'm like, Phew. that was just the pizza I ate last night. <laughs> and I went to turn around in a Frank's nursery. And I go to pull around, I turn in the parking lot to turn my car around and go home, and there the guy is sitting on the sidewalk. It was a divine appointment. I, no one will ever convince me otherwise. But the guy's sitting there, and like, what do you, you know, I was new at this. I'm like, what do I do? You know, what do I say? I, I rolled down my window, and I'm like, how you doing, man? Like, and when he looked up at me, I thought he was going to bark at me or something, and he was just like, he had the nicest voice. He's like, I'm doing all right. I said, hey, do you need anything, you know? Money, a ride? He's like, no, I'm, I'm doing all right, man, thanks, but thanks for asking. I'm like, okay. So I pull out, and I'm like, okay, did my job. And I'm driving, and I felt, again, go back. I'm not, this is no joke. This is a true story. Here's what I, this might blow some people's theology away. Not mine. In my heart, I felt that still little whisper, you know, the whispers of God, said, that man used to serve me when he was younger. Go back. I felt that. 
turned my car around, went back. By this time, he's standing down the road waiting for, his, waiting for a ride. I park my car. I get out. By this time, I'm like, whatever. I'm all in now, okay? You got me, you know? And I walk up to this guy, and I'm like, hey, um, do you mind if I talk to you for a minute? He's like, I ain't got nothing but time. And I just, I led by this. I say, you know, I'm a believer. I just, I'm a Christian. You know, I just, and I got to ask you this. Like, do you know Christ or did you ever, I'm trying to word it, you know. And he says, yeah, as a matter of fact, I was, I was a believer. He said, years ago, I lived in a house with some other guys and we were really on fire for God. He said, we were Christians, we'd encourage one another. He said, every year we'd go at spring break, we'd go to Florida, we'd walk the beaches, we'd get, we'd give pe get people to Christ, and we'd share the gospel with people. And then he said, one of my best friends that lived in the house went through a season of depression, and he killed himself. And he said, I lost my faith when he killed himself, and I've never went back. I'm like, well, how do you, how do, you do it? He said, I just keep myself busy, and I try not to think about it. And I said, well, I believe the Lord sent me by today to let you know how much he loves you. And he's got good things in store for you. And don't give up on your faith. And he just opened right up. All of a sudden, we started having this talk. And literally, at that point, I felt like I was going to give him an invitation. I'm like, do you want to pray with me? He said, no, no, that's okay. He said, but if God sends more people like you across my path, I just might. And I drove away that day, shaking a little, you know. But I was like, it, it felt good that God used me to offer an invitation to a man to come back. And I pray and hope that that man did come back. But I say all that to say, that's our job. God paid the price. And all we have to do is extend that invitation to the people that we know and love. Amen?